Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial and Midnight. My name is Heath, and I am so excited to talk to you about Horror Express on Blu-ray from Arrow Video. There have been previous home video releases of this movie, actually quite a few. I believe it was even in public domain for a while. Uh, but there have been a few official releases of Horror Express, but you guys, this one, Arrow Video, takes the cake. This, I, I feel comfortable saying that this is now the definitive home video release of Horror Express. This thing is jacked to the gills. It is loaded with special features. It's been doing push-ups over in the corner waiting for me to hit record so that it could just pounce into this video. Um, a quick overview of Horror Express. Christopher Lee, let's admire Christopher Lee's very sexy mustache. He looks very manly there. And uh, Peter Cushing, Telly Savalas. Peter Cushing is actually becoming the more I revisit some of these movies, the more experienced I get, maybe the older I get, I don't know. Peter Cushing is quickly becoming one of my absolute favorite um, genre film actors. Uh, here's the, the elevator pitch. Here's the train car pitch of Horror Express. Uh, Christopher Lee finds this old fossilized guy, creature thing in, um, like in the East in Asia, and he packs it up on a train. He's a scientist. He, he represents the institution of science. This movie is kind of like a science versus supernatural um, kind of a thing, like uh, science versus you know, reason versus superstition. There's a lot of that. He packs the thing up on a train. They pack it down on ice. They start heading uh, towards Europe and uh, people start dying on the train. So, but it's a monster that's doing the killing uh, or is it? So it's kind of got this thing of um, Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express, which is not a coincidence because the Spanish title of this, of this movie, it's a Spanish shot film. I can't say it's a Spanish film. The director was Spanish. The producer, there, there's American uh, influences there as well. But the uh, the Spanish title of the film was Penico. Here, I don't speak Spanish as a native language, uh, but I will. I do believe Penico in el Transiberiano, which is Panic on the Trans-Siberian. Uh, and so they were clearly going for that Murder on the Orient Express vibe. Um, but then there's the hammer thing because you've got Cushing, you've got Lee, uh, and they bring what they bring. Because they you know, they did movies together all the time for Hammer, um, but it's a little bit different here. They're not adversarial in this movie. Well, they, they start kind of from different places and then they come together uh, as the film progresses actually pretty quickly. Uh, but they did that from time to time. I know um, I'm thinking of the Gorgon, the Gorgon, however you pronounce, uh, you know, the Hammer film where they team up to fight the Medusa creature. Um, Hound of the Baskervilles, I believe, is another one. Anyway, um, they are cooperative in this movie. And that's cool because we don't get to see that enough. There are far more movies where they're adversaries than when they're working together. So they're working together on this train to figure out, hey, who's killing all these people in these very gruesome ways? Uh, and uh, so there's the, so we've got now got, we've got, uh, the Agatha Christie element, a Hammer Films element, and then there's like this H.P. Lovecraft element over the whole thing. It's like, it's just been washed in H.P. Lovecraft because there's all this cosmic stuff, science fiction. You can't pin this movie down. And that's what I appreciate about it is because it's a little bit horror. Uh, it's a lot horror, uh, some action, some mystery, some science fiction. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty great. It's pretty, it's pretty rad movie. Um, but the thing is, like, it's it's uh, it's got this European patina that it, it's kind of hard to describe. But Martin Eugenio Martin, the director, went by Gene Martin. Uh, I'll just call him Gene Martin, I guess. So Martin had done some spaghetti westerns in the '60s, at least one, um, and so it kind of feels spaghetti, even though it's not an Italian shot film. He was Spanish, but you know, a lot of the spaghetti westerns filmed in Spain. We'll just say Euro. It's got a Euro film feel. Euro film feel. <laughs> um, but uh, there's even the music. The uh, the director, the, the composer's name, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, John Cacavas, C-A-C-A-V-A-S. Uh, -A -A um, does, he does this it's like this whistled refrain that keeps coming up over and over and over in the movie. At one point, the monster itself is whistling this tune, but it sounds straight out of a spaghetti western, a Euro western, okay? It's got that European, uh, that thing, that pop European mid-60s, late 60s, even though this movie's 1972 when it was released in Spain. Uh, it feels very much of that Leone kind of tradition with the music, at least, the Ennio Morricone stuff. Uh, and fun fact, so Telly Savalas is in this movie. He kind of makes a third act bow. Um, 
and uh, Kakavas, hopefully I'm saying it right, I ended up doing all of the music. He, he, you know, he worked with Telly Savalas on this movie and he ended up doing all of the music for Kojak. This is a, a period for Savalas as well as kind of between, you know, he'd done the Dirty Dozen and he was in Europe doing things like that. He was working in Italian movies and Spanish movies and things like that. And then Kojak, just like a year after this, I believe, I think it was 73 that Kojak burst onto the scene. Who loves you, baby? Um, it became like a sensation and it went for years. Uh, and that was kind of a rejuvenation of the Savala's thing. Uh, but uh, it's just interesting to me that they had worked t together here as well. And that carried over. Um, a really special movie. A really fantastic genre defying, not defining, defying movie. Hard to pin down. And this thing is loaded. I talked about how packed it is. So let's, this is the cover. It has reversible cover art. So I will show you guys. Uh, first of all, you know, Arrow always does these uh, little cards of their other releases. So mine came with Southland Tales, which, full disclosure, I've never seen Southland Tales, which I really should. Um, so there's the inside. This is our booklet. Fantastic booklet, you guys. We take the booklet out, and we've got our reversible cover art. I think I'm still using the original on the outside, but our reversible cover art looks like this. Um it's beautiful, right? Like both of these, I don't know that I prefer one over the other. They're both absolutely stunning. So the booklet itself is filled with, uh, it's got a couple of essays. One of them is new for this, um, for this release. It's called Horror Express by uh, Adam Scoville. Uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great essay. And the other one is writing the, this is blown out. It's Writing the Horror Express, which is being reprinted here from, uh, it's by Mike Hodges, and it was it originally appeared in Fangoria, number 186, September of 1999. And it's kind of an overview of this director's career. Uh, but that's just the printed special features. The, the, the disc special features are amazing. So there's a couple of new special features from director uh, Daniel Griffith, who who did fantastic work on that feature-length documentary from the Waterworld Arrow release that we just talked about here on the channel a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's doing the same thing. Nothing feature-length here. I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a much shorter running time, but still very informative. Um, so those are fantastic. And then there's... Um, so there's a couple of special features that were held over from a previous Severin Films release. Um, and those are valuable to have as well. And then there's also, so there's a spotlight on um, uh, the producer, Bernard Gordon, Bernard Gordon, depending on where you are, um, talking about how he was, he was like a blacklisted communist in the 50s and the 60s during the whole communist witch hunt in Hollywood. You know, Bogey testified, Humphrey Bogart, like the whole thing. There's like a, like a 30 minute, I think it's 30 minutes, uh, where he... They sit down with him before he died. He's been gone for a while now, but they someone sat down with him before he died and talked to him about being a writer in Hollywood, being a, being a person in Hollywood during that time, what it was like to be blacklisted, how you how you had to get around it, what you could do. Um, guy had an incredible career, very interesting career, and for someone to be able to sit down and talk about being a blacklisted communist from the golden age of Hollywood... This is that's fancy, man. That's that's fascinating, right there. That's fantastic stuff. They sit down with the composer to talk about uh, his work on the film, and I think my favorite. I, I, I say that the the Daniel Griffith documentary stuff is really great as well. Kim Newman does a co he co commentaries this thing with uh, with Stephen Jones and Kim Newman. I think I, I talk about him on the channel from time to time. I think he's my favorite film commentator. Uh, like critic guy. I wouldn't call him a critic. He's more just like an expert. He's an enthusiast. He's an eccentric, uh, which I can relate to. And Kim Newman is a guy who um, he shares my sensibilities. You know, you always kind of find a person that you latch onto that shares your approach to something. Kim Newman is my guy. I love Kim Newman. Uh, and so he does, uh, a, they do, they have a really fun commentary with us. Um, so this thing is amazing. Uh, the, the, the video quality looks absolutely stunning. You know, they talk about how this movie has never really looked good. Joe Dante says that he saw it in a theater in the early 70s 
and he could see like the tape lines from where they had edited things and taped it together and it was baked into he believes it was baked into the film negative the, the the print that he was watching so he believes that even the source the very beginning source of this movie was always flawed from the beginning but no more because you guys this thing looks stunning it's been restored it looks so crisp that you can count the hairs you can you can count the hairs on Christopher Lee's mustache you just want to you just want to reach out and lovingly curl the tips um it, it looks fantastic i do want to talk really quickly about peter cushing the role that peter cushing gives in this movie listen the the more that i revisit some of these movies uh, i love christopher lee i love peter cushing there's something about peter cushing especially during this era uh, that makes me feel um empathetic sympathetic makes me connect with him a little bit more uh his wife had died like a year prior to this film and he was so sad and so lonely and so depressed. And it, honestly, I don't think he ever recovered from that. And I can relate to that. I think his wife was his best friend. And when she was gone, life was kind of over for him. He was very clear. He would say in interviews, I'm just biding my time. I'm just waiting to join her. And I don't think he ever changed his opinion on that. You can even watch movies from like a decade later. Peter Cushing before his wife died and Peter Cushing after his wife died. Um, they're almost like two different people. He's very subdued. Even in Star Wars in 1977, he's not quite the same. It, the, the, the weight loss, the gauntness, a lot of that came from his, uh, his loneliness. And so the Cushing that we get in here, in this movie, uh, with him and, and, uh, and, and Christopher Lee working together, it's a different kind of Cushing. It's like a softer, more grandfatherly Peter Cushing. I just love the guy. I just really connect with him so much. You just want to like, he just feels like, uh, like, like, you know, like maybe he carries Werther's originals, <laughs> butterscotches in his pocket. It, he just feels very relatable and very approachable and very flawed and very human. Um, you don't get a lot of that from Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee was always commanding with, you know, Gandalf, Gandalf, you will not take the Palantir, Gandalf. Having said all that, I'm going to uh, to wind this down by just saying that I think this is fantastic. This is one of the best releases of the year. Surprise! It's Arrow Video, and it's one of the best releases of the year. For those of you that love Horror Express, for those of you that have seen this, who have uh, cherished this movie, this is the version to get. This is the archive version of Horror Express. Can't imagine it being done any better than here. So guys, thanks for hanging out, talking some Horror Express. I appreciate you guys. Take care, and until next time, I will catch you later.